Hello and welcome to this NET English talk through focusing today on the poem Remains. We'll start with a reading of the poem, so Remains. On another occasion we got sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank and one of them legs it up the road, probably armed, possibly not. Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else are all of the same mind. So all three of us open fire, three of a kind all letting fly. And I swear, I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. So we've hit this looter a dozen times and he's, he's there on the ground, sort of inside out. Pain itself, the image of agony. One of my mates goes by and tosses his guts back into his body. Then is carted off in the back of a lorry. End of story. Except not really. His blood shadow stays on the street, and out on patrol I walk right over it week after week. Then I'm home on leave, but a blink, and he bursts again through the doors of the bank. Sleep, and he's probably armed, possibly not. Dream, and he's torn apart by a dozen rounds. And the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. He's here in my head when I close my eyes, dug in behind enemy lines, not left for dead in some distant, sun-stunned, sand-smothered land, or six feet under in desert sand, but near to the knuckle, here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. Let's talk briefly about Simon Armitage. Now, Simon Armitage is a hugely respected English poet, uh, and as of 2019, he's also the current poet laureate. Um, in addition to writing poetry, he has written novels, plays, songs, travelogues. Um, he's also had success as a DJ, as a singer, as a lecturer, and as a broadcaster. He's done a lot. Now, he was born in Huddersfield and raised in the village of Marsden, both of which are in Yorkshire. And he's had a lifelong passion for the landscape in which he grew up, which has been a recurring influence on his life and his work. Although Armitage has written poetry throughout his life, influenced by writers such as uh, Ted Hughes, uh, Seamus Heaney. He also trained and did work as a probation officer. Now Simon Armitage's style is distinctive. Um, his poetry and his prose writing show a very concise, direct, honed style. Um, they show a clear social conscience, uh, an observational fascination, but that's all coupled with a humanity and a sympathy for the people around him and also quite often uh, a dry subversive and sometimes mischievous sense of humor the poem remains comes from a 2008 collection called the not dead now the poems in the collection explore the impact and aftermath of conflict and they draw on accounts of soldiers first-hand accounts of soldiers uh, who fought in wars across the 20th and 21st centuries. And the intention is to give the survivors a voice, really. Now, Remains is based on the experiences of Guardsman Tremans, who was a veteran of the 2003 Iraq War. Now, Tremans was part of a group of soldiers involved in the shooting of a looter. And the poem recounts the experience uh, and the mental and emotional trauma that he suffered afterwards. And much of it uses the soldier's own words. To turn to the title then, remains as a title is quite ambiguous. Uh, probably the most obvious meaning is the reference to human remains, as in the parts of the body that are left after death. And it has connotations of uh, particularly things like crime scenes and of murder. The title also, though, does refer in a broader and a more basic sense to whatever is left afterwards, what is left behind. So the soldier's traumatic memories, uh, even the soldier himself, now, despite being structured using stanzas, so we get these seven quatrains and this final unrhymed couplet, the poem is written essentially in free verse. So there's no rhyme scheme, uh, no reliable number of syllables in each of the lines. The effect of that, along with the quite accessible colloquial uh, jamon, is to offer a sense of a clear and authentic voice rather than of a self-consciously constructed poetic style. So what the poem becomes is almost almost a dramatic monologue, except that it's written as a constructed version of the soldier rather than being a fictional character. It could also be argued that the poem is in stream of consciousness, which is a style in which the narrative voice simply flows from thought to thought as it occurs. Now that would fit with the sense of the poem as a kind of 
therapeutic, uh, sorry, therapeutic confession for the soldier, um, an attempt to process the experience narratively and verbally. The first stanza begins with reference to this being on another occasion, and that suggests that it's simply one of many unremarkable, almost routine, similar occasions. The soldiers are a, soldiers are a group, um, and the pronouns are very much collective for the first few stanzas. So, we got, three of us, we've hit, rather than being individual. Notice also that the soldiers are sent out. And the verb choice there shows a lack of control, a lack of ownership or agency on their part. They've been sent to deal with the problem, to tackle looters. And there's a casualness to the colloquial description of how one of them legs it up the road. In the same way that the soldiers aren't individuals, the looter at this point is simply one of them. He's not a person, at least not yet. The final line of that first stanza, however, is the one that resonates throughout the soldier's experience and also through the remainder of the poem. The idea that the, the, the looter is probably armed, possibly not. The probability that the looter is armed is what dictates the actions of the soldiers in the second stanza. All three are of the same mind and all of them open fire. In a sense, the collective action helps to justify their actions. It's not simply the judgment of a single soldier, but something all three think. It links back to the collective pronouns used for the soldiers. They're a group, three of a kind. They're anonymous within their military role, simply myself and somebody else and somebody else. Each of them is artificially joined to the others through the connective and. The sentence running across the three lines helps to emphasise Almost like the flow and continuity of the moment. They're there, they react, they shoot. The shift comes in the fourth line. They move from being we and us to the soldier becoming I in I swear. There's a security, a comfort, uh, a collective responsibility and a group mentality to being a soldier in the poem. But the aftermath is something dealt with individually. The splitting of I swear and I see every round across the second and the third stanzas helps to create a sense of personal division, of, of shock, of mental dislocation to the moment. It's almost like it's happening in slow motion as the soldier sees every round as it rips through his life. The implication seems to be that this is a memory that the soldier has revisited, has relived. Notice also that it's not through him, but through his life. The narrator is only too aware that the looter's life is being torn away with every bullet that hits him. And life here can refer to both the act of living, as in they're killing him, but also the entirety of his existence, every part of who he is, of what he does, and, and so on, is being stripped from him in that moment. The reference to seeing broad daylight on the other side is ironic. We associate daylight with optimism, and the phrase itself is often used to refer to the hope of a better future. Here, it's about the enormity of what comes next, the brutal, shocking clarity of living from this moment onwards with the guilt and uncertainty of what happened. Notice again that I see every round, I see broad daylight. The shooting was a collective act, but the soldier is individually responsible. We're offered a similar moment of shock, of dislocation, in the splitting of the sort of inside out and pain itself. The image itself is disturbing, of the looter's insides being on the outside, but it's the pain the looter is suffering that seems to turn him into pain itself, the personification of suffering, the image of agony. The narrator is, is offering us his own metaphor here. Equally shocking is the casual callousness with which the body is treated, almost the disrespect. One of the other soldiers tosses his guts back into his body before he's carted off in the back of a lorry. The verb tosses suggests a lack of respect for the looter's remains, for his guts, as if they're things of which to be disposed, things to be disregarded, rather than fundamental and essential to life. Being carted off also reflects the same mentality, not carried carefully, reverently, but transported like an unwanted object, like waste material. It's ironic in a sense that the looter who was anonymously one of them 
in the first stanza has gained an identity. He's there on the ground. His guts are being tossed back into his body and he's carted off. The man's become more of a meaningful individual to the soldier when dead than he was when he was alive. End of story, the next stanza says, but with a sense of irony. At the end of the narrative of the event itself, and Armitage seems to suggest where the reader's narrative focus would generally finish, but the aftermath is also part of the process. After all, we've got the looter's blood shadow that stained on the street. There's a literal level to the image, of course, because the blood-stained outline of where the body lay is still there. But there's also the sense of his blood and therefore the guilt and the lost life overshadowing everything the soldier does. And the soldier has to walk right over it week after week. There's a constant reminder of what happened. And there's also associations of, of a lack of respect once again. He has to walk right over it. There's a sudden shift to the narrator being home on leave, which should be an escape. But, and with another dislocation across the stanzas, the presence is still constant. Blink, and he bursts again through the doors of the bank. Sleep. And he's probably armed, possibly not. Dream. And he's torn apart by a dozen rounds. The dead man is invading, not simply his waking moments, but his dreams, suggesting that the soldier can't control the memories. Notice the repetition of probably armed, possibly not. It's the uncertainty, the ambiguity that seems to trouble the soldier. If the man was armed, probably, then the shooting was justified, since there was a danger to the soldiers themselves. If the man was unarmed, possibly, then the man wasn't a threat and the killing can't be justified. And the implication seems to be that there's no possible answer to the question. This can't ever be resolved. And trapped within this cycle of recollection, the soldier appears to have turned to other methods of escape. The drink and the drugs won't flush him out, with the alliteration helping to build an association between those two things, drink and drugs. It's unclear whether the drugs are prescribed or illegal, but the impact, or lack thereof, is the same. Flush him out is a hunting and also potentially a military term in which prey is chased out of a place of concealment. But the looter here can't be dislodged, since he's trapped in the soldier's mind and memories. The sentence once again flows across stanzas, suggesting that the soldier is struggling to separate reality from memory, that it's all merging into one continuous stream. The looter is here in my head when I close my eyes, with the suggestion being that the looter is both a living memory for the soldier and also a constant presence in his conscious thoughts. Dug in behind enemy lines is a military term in which troops have secured their position in an area which is under enemy control and they can't be dislodged. The enemy lines here refers to the inside of the soldier's head. And the looter is dug in, he's embedded. Dug in is also ironic because it could be interpreted as an image of burial. And the looter can't be buried because he's alive within the soldier's mind and memory, rather than being left for dead in some distant, sun-stunned, sand-smothered land, or six feet under in desert sand. The assumption, Armitage suggests, is that when soldiers return home, they're home, that they've escaped, they're able to leave traumatic events back where they occurred. Instead, these events have followed this soldier home. Sun links us back to broad daylight, and sand is often used as an image of time and the enormity of space. <coughs> now that's reinforced, I think, by the hissing sibilance throughout the two final lines of the stanza. The implication is that the traumatic events of this kind can't simply be left where they occurred. They can't be compartmentalised in the same way that the soldier is also the man who's at home and time won't degrade or fade the memory. With the inconclusiveness of it and the lack of resolution, perhaps also why the final stanza is a couplet rather than a quatrain. This isn't the end of it. Instead, what we get as we flow into the final stanza on this messily, indistinct blurring of memory and reality is that the dead looter is near to the knuckle, he's nearby, and the knuckle hints at violence, at discomfort, it's challenging, it's problematic, it's current and it's immediate. He's here and now. The soldier's left with his bloody life in my bloody hands, with bloody here being an adjective both literally referring to blood, the violent death of the looter, and also an expletive 
to show the strength of his emotion and the shock. There's also a literary association between bloody hands and a sense of personal guilt, um, which if you've studied Macbeth, you will know. And it's precisely that sense of individual personal responsibility that the narrator is left with. It's continuous, it's inescapable, and it's unending. In terms of useful connections and comparisons, the most obvious one is probably with, with war photographer. And that's in terms of the link between military conflict, uh, choice and consequence, individual suffering, conscience, and so on. It could also link us to a poem such as Kamikaze, of course. Um, there's also, though, the wider military link to be made, potentially with poems like Exposure or Bayonet Charge. Perhaps even something like The Charge of the Light Brigade, although that would be more of a contrast than a comparison. Again, there's the possibility of exploring the idea of individual and collective power and powerlessness uh, in terms of a comparison with something like Checking Out My History or the emigre uh, or even the treatment of people and the fragility of a life in terms of something like Tissue or My Last Duchess. There's also possibly in terms of nature, sand and power versus powerlessness, something like Ozymandias. Um, but again, that's less obvious and possibly less fruitful as a comparison. Thank you for listening. Uh, please remember that there are videos on all the other poems and the other GCSE English topics on the NET English YouTube channel, which is www.youtube.com slash NET English 1.